Please take our Hurley Burley Personal History of Mobile Technology pop quiz. How many cell phones have you owned? 8, 12, more than 27? Was your first cell phone a huge mid-80s model that you'd arm curl for huge mid-80s biceps? Or did all of your jeans feature a front pocket scar in the precise outline of a Razor flip phone? The point is, access to mobile technology is something most of us have taken for granted. But there are so many young Canadians aging out of foster care who don't have access to the kinds of tools and technology they need to live independent lives. That's why our presenting sponsor, TELUS, created their Mobility for Good program. It provides Canada's most vulnerable youth with a fully subsidized cell phone and data plan at no cost, as well as training and tools to participate safely in our digital world. For young people leaving foster care, a phone is often their lifeline. Mobility for Good is available to nearly 20,000 youth across the country and helps them build credit, search for somewhere to live, find education and job opportunities, and stay in communication with their support network when they're on their own for the very first time. To date, TELUS has invested more than $8 million in Mobility for Good, and it's just one part of their All Connected for Good program, which works to ensure that all Canadians, regardless of their location or circumstances, have access to the technology and resources they need to navigate the digital world. To learn more about how TELUS helps us stay all connected for good, go to connectingcanadaforgood.ca. Hi, it's David Hurley, and welcome to a very unique edition of the Hurley Burley. We're doing our version of an Ontario Liberal leadership debate today, which means, as it does with all things Hurley Burley, we'll do it unpredictably, unconventionally, Unnational News Networkly. I am thrilled that we have five of the six leadership candidates here in the studio. Welcome, Michael Coto, Kate Graham, Alvin Tetsko, Brenda Hollingsworth, and Mitzi Hunter. Thank you. Stephen Del Duca declined our invitation to participate today, although I'm sure he's listening somewhere. Hey, Stephen, have a cab and listen in. Um, okay. About five and a half months ago, here on the pod, Jenny Byrne referred to the federal leaders debate as a goat rodeo. Because, let's face it, the format for that one was awkward, hard to follow, overly scripted, and laborious. So this is going to be a no goat rodeo debate. (laughs) There are no podiums, just six people sitting around a studio. There are no prepared opening and closing statements, but rather opening and closing questions that the candidates have not seen in advance. Part of my role is to play debate cop, here to arrest overly canned talking points immediately. (laughs) This is going to be an equitable and fair debate, but it's not necessarily an equal time debate, which means you have to be interesting to get into the conversation. I'm not a timekeeper. There's no studio audience, so Penny from Owen Sound will not be standing up to read a pre-approved question. And finally, I want to stress that this is not a roast or an accountability session. Each of these good people is applying for a very serious job. So let's hear what they really think. Candidates, welcome to the Hurley Burley. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to start with a question that I would like all of you to answer. And I'll start with you, Michael. Um, And... The question is, we are recording this and it will be aired on the eve of the weekend where delegates are selected. Um, You may take issue with this, but it's widely considered in the public that Stephen Del Duca, who is not here, has a significant lead in the race for delegate positions on the weekend. Uh, So this debate is a chance to alter that trajectory. And so my question is, if we are headed toward uh, a Stephen Del Duca victory, why shouldn't we? Why not just let that roll? Why should something happen in the party this weekend that upsets that dynamic and changes it? Why you and not Stephen Del Duca, Michael? Well, throughout this race, I've been talking about um, reimagining this province and rethinking what it means to be a liberal. Uh, and I've been very clear on my position with Stephen's uh, push for um, the fight, um, that this is... Uh, the fight of our lives. And um, I agree that the mechanics of the party are an important thing. We've got to raise money. We've got to find good candidates, build good policy. But there's so much more to it. Um, We need to figure out exactly what we're fighting for and who we're fighting for. And that's why my campaign's been a values-driven campaign. I believe that back in June of 2018, 
the strongest thing that we had as an asset in this party with so much loss was our values. And I've run a values-driven campaign to say that I believe if we go back to those values as liberals, those core values and build from them, uh, we can actually align this party with where the people of Ontario want to go. There's a lot of anxiety that's out there, a lot of uh, uh, people that are not sure about the future of this province. And I keep talking about us eventually hitting a wall in this province when it comes to our trajectory of infrastructure, spending and services. And I believe that we need to look into the next 40 years, not just the next four, in order to build a party and a province that's, uh, that's prepared to take on the challenges of tomorrow. And that's why I'm running. I believe that, I believe that out of all the candidates here, I have the most political experience. And I know I'm not saying that to sound like boastful. I'm just saying I've been elected for almost 17 years at the school board. I've been elected at uh, Queen's Park. I've served I have six ministerial responsibilities. I've run a national literacy organization. I've been an entrepreneur. I'm a, a father, a brother, uh, an ordinary, everyday Ontarian uh, who believes that uh, this province is the best place to live in. And I believe that there's so much lost opportunity. And I can detect that, identify it, and build a team that can actually go out there and build off of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brenda, why should delegates, why should members this weekend vote for Brenda Hollingsworth delegate? delegates instead of Stephen Del Duca delegates. Right. So when I joined the race, um, it wasn't something that I had been planning for my whole life. I uh, was very happily running my law firm in Ottawa, um, representing Ontarians in all kinds of matters. But I started to get very, very angry at Doug Ford and what they were doing and the cuts and the rhetoric. And so I started to think about what am I going to do? And as I was investigating the Liberal leadership race, I thought, well, you know, hopefully there'll be somebody that uh, we can rally around so that we reclaim the province in 2022. As I looked at the race, um, and keep in mind, I had never met any of these people at this point, but I, I looked at the race and I thought, oh boy, I am, I am not confident that the slate we have is the slate we need. Um, you know, and early in the summer or um, as the summer progressed, you started hearing words like coronation. And I thought, no, that, you know, not on my watch. And so uh, my plan was to join early in the fall, but um, I had a trial that just wouldn't settle. So that didn't happen. But I really felt like given the message that was delivered in 2018, if we didn't do something dramatic, uh, there was a very good chance that the voters were not going to see that change had happened. We're not going to entertain um, that this party wasn't the same party that they rejected pretty resoundly. And I thought, okay, well, you know, if not me, then who? And I waited to see if who was going to come, who did not come. And so, um, you know, I just decided we need somebody with a different voice, somebody with experience outside Queen's Park, um, you do hear, well, I hear, when I go to the doors, when I talk to people, you hear words like uh, Queen's Park elites, and, and they were only interested in power, they were only interested in it for themselves. Having met these people, I know that's not true, but perception Maybe matters. Maybe for me, but not <laughs> <them>. <laughs> Right. Well, but perception <laughs> really matters, right? And so um, it, it doesn't matter what the empirical evidence shows. It's how people feel. And I'm not confident that the voters are going to feel Stephen Del Duca. Maybe the party does, but I'm not sure voters are going to. Okay. Kate, why you and not him? Okay. Uh, well, this is a really unusual moment that we're in. So we are in the worst spot that the party has been in its history. We have lost official party status, but it's also a really important moment where we have nothing to lose and we will rise up again. The question is just into what? And that's what this race is about. It's a lot bigger than who the next leader is. It's who we are and what we stand for and how we go back to Ontarians and say, okay, we heard you and we have changed. I am running because I want to fundamentally change the culture in our party and how we do politics in Ontario. I do think there are a few things about me personally that are a strategic benefit to the party. So being the youngest person in the race, you know, millennials are now the largest voting bloc. That's an important group we need to connect with. Being the only person in the race who grew up in a small town. I live in a mid-sized city. I, I live in a rural part of Ontario. We have lost every rural, every small town, every mid-sized city, and our path forward requires us to earn those places back. We lost people to the left and the right. And one of the things I am most proud of, my experience is 
the hallmark has been being able to work with people who have different ideas across party lines. That's why I've been endorsed by three Green Party candidates. It's why on my team, there's someone who ran for the NDP in 2018. It's why we've raised about $40,000 from wealthy conservative farmers in the Southwest who haven't voted liberal for a long time. Our path to success means we need to welcome people home. And the way that we do that is by talking about issues that people care about. They care about inequality reducing the gap between rich and poor. They care about climate change. They care about healthcare and education. I am running on a campaign about improving the quality of life of every Ontarian. I want to see less partisanship and more focus on people. And I believe that that is what people are looking for. I don't think we can win if we look the same in 2018 as we did in 2022. It's got to be a really dramatic shift where we can say, Ontarians, we heard you. We are fundamentally different than we were before. That's the reason I'm in this race. And that's the reason I believe this weekend when uh, liberals look deep and they say, this race is about party of the past or party of the future. I wouldn't be running if I didn't think future is going to win. Alvin, tons of people are headed to these meetings this weekend to vote for Del Duca. What do you say to them to tell change their minds on their way? <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's no surprise. I've brought some uh, different aspects to this race. Um, but at the same time, David, I'm not, I'm not against anybody else, right? I, I think there are much more that unites us and, and that we have in common as, as liberals. So you're okay if he wins? I'm okay if anybody no, wins. No, but I mean, you're, yeah. you're, you're like right now. Yes. You're get, if it's Michael, if it's Mitzi, if it's Steven, if it's Brenda, if it's Kate, I am going to run for this party no, again. No, but right now you want to win. Absolutely. So what's the key differentiator? <laughs> I think that, I mean, the, the whole reason we, any of us, I think, decided to run in this race is because we felt that we brought a unique perspective to this, right? right. Kate, I was the youngest person until yeah, you sorry. started running. <laughs> what I think are you, we, 18 months? Something, or something like that, yeah, a few months apart. It's almost unfair. <laughs> um, and, and that's incredibly important. You know, people came up to us individually saying, uh, we are looking for something new in this party to represent that, right? To represent the party. Bring some new ideas and, and bring some fresh ideas that maybe have been uh, on, on the shelf for a couple of years because we were afraid to run on those things. Things like merging the school boards, things like basic income, uh, things like universal child care that I, I've, I've been pushing with throughout this. But at the same time, we keep talking about how we have to respect and, and listen to each other there are 40,000 members, and if they decide to vote for Stephen or Michael or anyone else in a, in a majority, then we have to support that. And we have to endorse the fact that, that that's who decided, that's what they decided to do. Right. right. Okay. Thanks. Mitzi, what's the argument for choosing you over Stephen Deldick in this race? So 1.1 million people voted liberal in the last election. And that tells me that. The people in this province understand what it means to have a progressive government. We are not just choosing the leader of the party. We are choosing the leader of this province. And that's what's at stake. We can't afford another four years of Doug Ford. Mm. I was just out with the elementary teachers. You know, almost a million students aren't in classroom today. And... Those parents, those students, those education workers, they need to see someone who is leading this party that could be ready to lead this province. Mm. That's why I'm in this race. You know, I'm the candidate that has stood for change in our party, leading the one member, one vote conversation in terms of how we select our leader. I wanted to move away from the delegated system because I felt that it was too closed, especially for the times that we are in. We need to open up the Liberal Party, be more modern, be more inclusive, and to really represent the grassroots people in this province, not just in areas that were, is easy to get to, but everywhere in this province. And that's why I'm in this race. And uh, Dave, I'm, I'm very hopeful. You know, I, I have gone to, you know, pretty much almost 100 of our local uh, associations at this point and met liberals in every corner of this province, even in like the far, far north. You know, when we canceled the Sudbury debate, I spent the day calling and there was a gentleman who was watching football, but he took time to, to talk to me. And, uh, and he took that time to talk to me because, you know, the things that we represent really matter to the people of this province. You know, good health care strong education, climate change, you know, indigenous reconciliation. All of those things really matter. 
And uh, that's what's at stake in this vote coming up this weekend. It's not just about, you know, the length of the political involvement in the party. I know that for me, you know, I've been elected for six years. I've done many other things before this. I've run businesses, started them, you know, large corporations. I have a business background. Mm -hmm. But also I've spent a lot of my time working in community. And when you work in community, you really are, you know, on the, you know, on the ground with people. And you look to governments to make the right sets of decisions. What I love most about this party is that we don't follow the herd. I know you've got a no goat road <laughs> rodeo t-shirt on right now, yeah. but we don't follow the herd in yeah. this party. You well, know, that's we we are clear minded. And um, and we make the right decision for the time. You know, you can just go back to other leaderships, whether it was Dalton McGinty and, frankly, even Kathleen Wynne. They weren't the front runners, but they were able to make their case to a group of clear-minded liberals who made the best choice for the party at the time. Great. Thank you. Thank you all for that. And that segues nicely into the question I was going to ask you, uh, and I'll start with you, Kate, um, which is... Uh, we, uh, uh, our party was uh, destroyed in the last campaign electorally, and we have less than party status. Um, I, you know, spend a lot of time beating myself up about that. Maybe not enough. But in any event, that is our reality. So Ontarians have two choices for government right now that are obvious in there. There's the governing conservatives, and there's the official opposition New Democrats, who presumably, if people were to get tired of the Conservatives, they have an official opposition to choose. Why should the Ontario Liberal Party reemerge and be the government? They, people have two choices. What is it about the Ontario Liberal Party that it should be resuscitated and be the government? Hmm. Uh, well... We're ahead in the polls right now. And so I think a lot of people are asking this question is how is it that a party after its worst defeat, uh, we've got a you know, phenomenal interim leader, but we are without a permanent leader. How are we so far ahead? And I think it speaks to that people know that the party has been the driver of positive change. They are proud to live in a province where we've got full day kindergarten. They are happy that we don't have smog days anymore. They liked more investment in mental health, transit. So we've got a really strong brand as a party, and yet we lost people's trust. And I believe that is because we lost touch with people. We stopped listening to them. Uh, we lost touch with the things that they care about. And so we need to show them that we are still the party that they know and trust that has driven progressive policies in this province uh, that's translated into an actual uh, improvement in their quality of life, but we need to change the way that we work. We need to fix the things that people were clearly fed up with within our party, but I think in politics generally, and show them that we have heard that message. Anybody else got a point of view about that? Why should it be the Liberal Party? Why do Ontarians need the Liberal Party? Well, where's the where's the official opposition? Like, you know, that's what a lot of people are asking because they don't see that right now. You know, we have a, a conservative, a very conservative government right now. It's made a mess of education. It's cutting health care. Can you imagine you cut public health, which drives, downloads costs to the local level? And we now have a super virus that's here mm. that public health have to scramble and keep people safe. It's just so risky right now under the Ford Conservatives. And I don't see the NDP stepping up to that. You know, a very simple example for me, last summer, Ford canceled Canada Day. We don't need that. We can go to our cottage, everyone else figure it out. Well, you know, I didn't think that was right. Who cancels Canada Day? So organized a people's picnic on the grounds of Queen's Park, 2,000 people show up to celebrate our province and our country's birth. So, you know, where was the opposition then? They were nowhere to be seen. So I, I think that there's a, there is a gap, and, and Kate's right, that the polls are showing that the Liberal brand is, uh, is definitely intact. But when they are really thinking about who leads this province, they need to see a Liberal Party that has changed. A party with a new face, a new voice, and new ideas for the future of this province. It can't be status quo. 
that's not going to cut it. Okay, Elvin, you have something to say about this? Yeah, I mean, Mitzi's absolutely right. The NDP's not up to the job. Andrea hasn't been up to the job for 10 years. If they were going to win the election uh, or form government, the, the last election in 2018 was their chance, right? I mean, Andrea's had 10 years. Everybody wants to criticize Peter McKay for not learning French. She's had 10 years to learn French. She hasn't mm-hmm. done that either, right? And they're not an effective opposition. How many elections did we fight as Ontario Liberals around the goddamn gas plants, right? right? But right now, already, since Doug Ford took office, uh, he canceled the whatever he said that made the, the project cancel with the U.S., and then he canceled the wind farms. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, right? And the opposition is nowhere on this, right? Mm. But people are seeing that Ontario Liberals are having new ideas. We are adding to the conversation. We're trying to give people a reason to vote for us again. And they're paying attention to that. They're paying attention to the fact that you have six very diverse, very qualified people who all could be better premiers than this one that we have right now. No kidding. Michael. So I don't think we're at a point where people should vote for the Liberals, um, even based on our past track record or while well, comparing us to the current government or the NDP. I think um, we have to get to a point within this party over the next year after we choose a leader um, uh, to develop the right type of policy that's truly reflective of where people are, that actually addresses the, the challenges that people have. So um, just because we're liberals and the polls look great and uh, the conservatives are doing what they're doing and the NDP are doing what they're doing, that's not good enough. Um, Our next election cannot be a focus point on them or Doug Ford. It has to be about us rethinking what it means to be a liberal and our policies will be reflective of that. You know, in June of 2018, and I've been saying this often, we had uh, uh, the best opportunity um, after the election um, uh, to... Uh, to rethink, because of our loss, we had no policy left, we have no structure within our party, everything was lost. But it's the best opportunity we've had in decades to, you know, to press restart and to rethink what it means. And uh, I think that's a great opportunity that we as uh, as candidates here, you know, through this process and through the party renewal process, we have a great opportunity. But you, people are not going to vote for liberals because because we're the you know, the opposite of Doug Ford or because of the comparison the NDP or the poll numbers, people are going to vote for liberals because the policies and the ideas and the authenticity of how that those ideas are created, it's actually a real thing and people connect to that. But so are that's the ideas what only we can come up with, Michael? Or it, No, it, you know, I met with some farmers yeah. this week, um, you know, I was uh, in uh, different parts of Ontario and, uh, you know, a farmer said to me, you know, how are you going to win me back into the party? And I said, that's not, that's not the question. When are you going to take your party back? You know, this was a party that was started by, you know, rural Ontarians, people who were protesting against the status quo, you know, over a hundred years ago. It's, it's, this, is, this is our party. When I say ours, I mean the people of Ontario. This is a, a party that resonates deep within the very, you know, the very mantra of what it means to be an Ontarian. And it's time for farmers. It's time for northerners. It's time for people in the city, anyone who feels left out, people who've been pushed aside to say, this is my party, and I'm going to take this party back. And that's how we beat Doug Ford, by forming that coalition of people who feel like they've been just pushed to the side and forgotten. And that's the type of party we need to build. And it's got to have a bit of that resilience in it. It's got to have a bit of a result. And uh, I think we can attract people based on them taking ownership of their party. Okay, Brenda, you had something you wanted to say about this? Yeah, Ontarians are essentially centrist people. They are interested in the middle way. They are interested in compromise. They're interested in being practical. And there is no reason why Ontario politics should be shifted to the right or shifted to the left unless what's in the centre isn't offering what's needed. I mean, Doug Ford, and to a certain extent the NDP too, rose a wave of populism that uh, had been going on for, you know, since the a decline in 2008. But we have a real opportunity here if we occupy the centre and if we make sure we're paying attention to all Ontarians and not just, you know, one group or another, but operate in the middle to make policies on jobs and the economy and education and healthcare that appeal to everybody. That's how we win them back. And that's what we offer that, um, you know, Doug Ford can't (laughs) offer because he's got his business buddies that he's got to please. And Andrea Horath can't offer because she's uh, on the left serving her public interest, her special interest groups. So really what we need to do is occupy the center where we are naturally and uh, make sure that our 
policies have a broad base of appeal, which we do by talking to the people, by making sure that we have policy conventions, by making sure that our policies reflect what the people of Ontario actually want. You know, um, everyone has said such great comments and and we've made such a difference uh, to this province. Like, you know, as I said, I was just out with the teachers and talking to kindergarten teachers, our investment in full day kindergarten. It's transformative. You know, you think about um, every four and five year old starting at the same place. And and that's a, that's about equity. It is about education, but it's also about equity as well. And and so we are the party that can do the very big things and make the big difference. But people have to recognize that we're on their side, you know, and a lot of people in rural Ontario, in northern Ontario, they haven't felt that in a long time. And I think that that's the opportunity that not only this race, but the next leader of the party has to take advantage of is connect with the just the regular people in this province and make sure that they feel heard and that the type of listening that we're doing actually influences us to change. And uh, it's not that we're coming in with a preset of ideas, but we're actually really looking to make those genuine connections. And that's the opportunity that we have in the next two and a half years. Okay, Kate, you ran in the last election, sort of entered electoral politics Hmm. In the last election, why did you great run for choice the, of election? Eh? Why, yeah, really. <laughs> why yeah, did you run really for the Liberal the right Party? Yeah. 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 Why did you choose the Liberal Party as your vehicle? So I'd been working uh, as a public servant for over a decade. I was a director at the City of London. There were a couple issues I'd been working on. One was about uh, transit investment, and the second was about mental health. And both were not moving even close to fast enough for my liking. And I'm not someone who wants to sit at home and complain and wish things were different. If you want to see something happen or something change, uh, you need to be prepared to step up yourself. And so I quit my job and I ran for the party. Uh, I ran for the party in large part because we were finally moving in the right direction. We had opened a supervised consumption site in London. We had finally, after about six or seven years of pushing for it, uh, made a commitment to investing in higher order transit systems. So it was the party that was doing the things that I wanted to see. Uh, I can read the polls like everybody else. I knew it was going to be a very tough race. I also ran in the toughest part of Ontario to win in. You know, we talked earlier about we're ahead in the polls in every part of Ontario except the Southwest. Mm. Uh, wow. So mm. it is a really tough part of Ontario to run. It's not like running in downtown Toronto, but I believe the party was moving us in the right direction. And I also believe that Again, if you want to see something change, you have to be willing to do it. So I left my job, I ran for office, and I am really glad that I did because it really opened my eyes to things that I want to see change inside the party and also in how we do politics in Ontario. Can Thanks. I pick a bone with you, David? Sure. Huh? So Kate was a phenomenal <laughs> candidate. I like to think I was a, a, a good candidate in terms of a first-time candidate. candidate, Elvin, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Um, but we had um, almost 40, 45 first-time candidates. And I thought there was an incredible opportunity in the last election to highlight these people, people like Kate, people like myself, who were coming to the party because of what we were running on, because of the track record that we had. Right. And I understand that, you know, Kathleen was the leader and, and she's the face of it. But I think there was a missed opportunity, especially in certain communities where you had new blood like, like Kate and I coming to the party to run for the first time because of the agenda that we had put forward. You think I made a mistake in the campaign? <laughs> <Shocking>. <laughs> Impossible. I missed the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. We've got some questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> Are you prepared for this unconventional podcast? Okay. This is my show. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. And when we come back, we'll see if any of these people know how to end the teacher strike. Trust. It's at the heart of every successful relationship, especially when it comes to buying a home. Ontario's 80,000 realtors are trusted every day to help their clients navigate one of the largest trans financial transactions of their lives, buying a home. Representing Ontario's realtors, the Ontario Real Estate Association is on a mission to increase trust and professionalism in Ontario's real estate industry. That means tougher rules to punish bad behavior, access to modern business tools, and better education. The Trust in Real Estate Services Act, or TRESA, delivers on that mission. 
TRESA is a groundbreaking piece of legislation that will make Ontario a leader in North America when it comes to real estate professionalism and trust. Go to www.orea.com to learn more. All right, we're back. Kids are out of school. Seems to be no end in sight. Anybody got an idea about how to end this? Well, I have three kids in school. All right. uh, And every week we're trying to find babysitters and parents and something, grandparents, to to take care of them. My kids are in kindergarten, grade two, and grade four, so we're seeing this all the time. Um, This is a government and a a party that does not understand that education is an investment. Clearly. The conservatives, you mean? The conservatives. They no, don't no, understand no, that education is an investment, <laughs> right? Over our 15 years in office, we increased our high school graduation rate. Uh, Mitzi was one of our phenomenal ministers. Uh, we're leading the OECD in post-secondary attainment. That leads to our um, leading economy, especially with foreign direct investment, right? It's it, it's a direct pipeline. Investment in education leads to a stronger economy. Um, they need to just put the resources where they where they should, right? And if they're refusing to add resources to that, my big idea so far throughout this campaign is that we should merge our Catholic and non-Catholic school boards. And that those study done a couple years ago talked about $1.6 billion that we could save every year that we could reinvest in the system that would negate the need for teacher strikes because we could provide them with a 2% living of wage increase that they're looking for. We could be able to uh, keep class sizes down and prevent students from having to take online courses. There are better ways that we can do this. And there are lots of boards across this province already who are working together, finding these efficiencies by working together. But it's the exception. It's not the rule. And there are some still issues with it that we need to move forward with. Michael? Yeah, as a uh, former school board trustee um, at the Toronto District School Board and as a, uh, a member of provincial parliament, I've had two different perspectives um, from a decentralized and centralized uh, negotiation table. School boards used to be responsible. And, of course, we created the provincial table to uh, – uh, to set the, uh, the the agenda and the parameters for uh, for the, any type of uh, uh, negotiations. And what I've what I've seen, regardless of what the model was like, is that if you enter these negotiations in, with a disrespectful tone, um, it doesn't allow people to actually get to those those endpoints because um, there's uh, there's politics outside of just. Um, you know, what takes place within those negotiation rooms is there's, you know, the union leaders, ministers, the government members, they all have to, you know, there's a political side to things. They've got a, an interest to uh, uh, to focus on. And I think the biggest problem and the biggest missed opportunity with this minister of education is that he went into this uh, in with a very disrespectful tone that separated uh, teachers uh, from the actual uh, process and and vilified them. And I think that was the missed opportunity. He should have went in there and embraced the work that teachers do, uh, supported the work that teachers have done over the last few decades to get us to this point of uh, almost a 90% graduation rate. This is because of good work from a lot of good teachers and um, celebrate their success and go into those negotiations. And I think that he would have landed in a much better place. And I think that was the biggest problem with the negotiations, the, the tone that they set. Okay, I, uh, Kate's next. I just want to interject here at this point and remind everybody that in the last election, we made a very strong argument in the campaign that governments had to have back-to-work legislation uh, as a tool available to them in public sector right. negotiations because at a certain point, governments are incredibly vulnerable to uh, to strikes in the public sector. And you remember what the NDP's response to that was? I, yeah, ineffective. I, I, I exactly. Yeah, I ineffective. Kate? That with them. So, uh, in my view, the central problem in politics today, and this can cross party lines, is that power is too concentrated. There are a few people who get to make all the decisions, and the cost of that is many other groups don't have a say anymore. So, one of the results of this can be things like teachers on the picket lines. I've been on the picket lines with the teachers. I was on the picket lines in the 1990s with my parents, who were both teachers. Uh, they will tell you that the reason that they're there, it's about e-learning. It's about class sizes. You know, I've yet to find a teacher or leader of a teacher's union who has been asked about those things and how it affects student outcomes. Instead, you've got a couple people at Queen's Park who think they know best, who think they know best how students learn. And like, spoiler alert, they don't. We need a government that is listening to people who know best the communities they serve and the problems they face and is there to support and partner them. That, you know, we all talk a big game about wanting to change politics. For me, this is the change, is we need to decentralize. So what would that look like? So it would look like listening to teachers. No, no, what would that look like? 
it would look like having an open conversation with teachers about we share a goal as the government and our large unions and educators in seeing students succeed. So let's talk about different ways that that can look. One of the things you'll learn very quickly is that Ontario is a very diverse province. The same idea almost never makes as much sense in one place compared to another. So e-learning, for example, there are big parts of Ontario where they don't have access to the internet. That is obviously a problem. So we need less one-size-fits-all, less one person at Queen's Park has the ability to make these decisions, a heck of a lot more listening to people who understand the communities and specific problems that we're facing across the province. I want to see more empowerment of communities, of sectors, of So would, you, would of professions. you break up the negotiations so that they're happening in smaller units across the province? No. What does that look like? It looks like listening to teachers, they will tell you that in certain boards, some things work and yeah. some things don't. I actually do think we should be using boards in a different way. You know, boards understand the unique context of their communities. A lot of school board trustees will tell you that other than deciding which school should be closed, never a fun decision. They don't get a lot of say in things like curriculum development or how it's implemented. We should change that. We need to look at ways of empowering people who are close to communities. All right, Brenda. One of the things that I bring to this race is really a different perspective. I've been a lawyer for 23 years. I've done a lot of negotiations, like thousands of you know, multi-million dollar cases, not quite as large as, uh, as the school board. But the strangest thing for me as an outsider looking at this is that the negotiation is happening on social media, that it's happening in the media. Mm -hmm. And like what Michael said, all of a sudden personalities have a stake in the game. I'm the union boss. If I don't do a good job, not only are my teachers not going to be happy, but I'm going to look like a fool to all of Ontario. It makes it very difficult to blink even if that's the right thing to do. So when we do negotiations, we are in a cone of silence. Like there, we are negotiating and there are no leaks. There is nobody live tweeting the negotiations. There are no memes. There is no nothing. And that is a real impediment to getting things now. Um, yeah, but that's a tool that people are using to apply pressure and get leverage. Right, but it, but it works for and against. Like right now, um, the community, Ontario hasn't really turned on the teachers. But if there are successive days of striking and it's very difficult for teachers, history sh shows us that some parents will turn. Right, they, right now, teachers deserve this, well, have the support, they deserve the support, but that will change for some people when they are inconvenienced because their kids aren't in school. Yeah. And so then um, it becomes leverage on both sides. Um, the leverage and also a big disadvantage. It makes it very difficult to compromise when you look weak in the eyes of everybody on social media. So I, I mean, if I were in charge, uh, there would be different rules or I would attempt to implement different rules so that everything doesn't happen in public so that people can actually have meaningful, nonpartisan, constructive conversations at the bargaining table rather than sound bites because that is uh, very damaging, very hard to negotiate in those conditions. Okay, Mitzi, the government that you were Minister of Education in uh, drove a pretty hard line with teachers on salaries and compensation over the time uh, that it was in uh, over the last four or five years, certainly. Uh, I think we're trying to hold it to net zero yeah. increases. Yeah. Um, and so is there, is, is, is that sort of created this problem? Is there some pent up demand that the teachers are more militant this time? No, um, no. This, is, this is not, this isn't about money and compensation. Um, the current agreements that uh, are being discussed right now are the extension agreements that I negotiated uh, when I was education minister. And um, of course, it was tough. Like we had round the clock bargaining and we had a very respectful cone of silence. Uh, everything was done at the bargaining table. We set parameters. The buck stops with the premier of this province and the tone that he has set for bargaining is what we're experiencing right now, which is complete chaos. The strike that's happening today with all of the elementary schools in this province closed, um, the education minister is MIA. He's not doing interviews. That's not leadership. And, you know, Jeff McMillan, who is a former chair of the Hastings board, uh, put out a, an endorsement support for me today because he said, as education minister, Mitzi was fair. And that's really important to me that the climate that we are in right now is not setting a tone for fairness at the bargaining table. Information is being withheld from the union and frankly from parents. Mm. Um, 
the the is the government's gover- position unreasonable? Very unreasonable. And why? What's unreasonable? Only, What's the worst thing about it? Not all, the worst thing about it is that their messaging has collapsed over and over. First, they said, "Oh, this is about wages and compensation." Well, that hasn't even been discussed at the table during the meetings. So how can it be about that? And then they said, "Well, this is about the union bosses telling teachers what to do." Clearly, they are out in solidarity with their unions. All four teacher unions are now in strikes and work to rule situation. So the unions have actually solidified their message. And uh, and this is a fight for public education. And that's what this is about. This is about, are we going to continue to make the investments in public education, as, uh, as Alvin has said, or are we going to start to dismantle this? And and that's what the fight is about. So can I ask this group of five people, how many people here um, would uh, sign a contract with the teachers based on the terms the teachers are currently? Uh, but what are the demand? terms, uh, David? Mm-hmm. We we're not at the table. Do we know? We don't terms? know what they're asking. We don't have those terms. I thought you right? might. So I thought even you might know. even there is one thing Ekfo talked about, which is the local priorities fund. And, and they're uh, upset that this government has ended funding for local priorities. We put that in place during the extension agreements mm. because that covers things like resources in boards in various degrees, right? Those are not all the same. That's why it's called local mm. priorities to fund special education. Maybe some boards actually choose to fund arts education because that's what they need. Mm-hmm. But the the important ingredient in that funding is that they can hire the adult teacher or education worker that is needed in that board. Okay. This government has cut that funding. What do you think is going to happen? Those programs are going to be withdrawn from the boards because they don't have the funding reliability to continue with those programs. That's what's at stake here. It's about quality education in all parts of this province. Okay. Regardless of who's right or wrong in it, if it goes on long enough, anybody here going to support back-to-work legislation? When I was in government um, and we were put forward with a proposition, I supported back-to-work legislation. Um, we, but we extend, like we went into every single possible scenario that we could examine. And, you know, I thought that there was good faith bargaining and, uh, it, it, it took place. Um, uh, I think the, the environment today is very different. Um, this is not just a, um, uh, an attack on public education. This is an attack on young people in the province of Ontario from, from universities to after-school programs, nutrition programs, autism services, uh, libraries, anything that um, is good that was being invested into young people seems to ha- have been uh, withdrawn uh, to some degree by this government. And uh, that same uh, you know amount of money seems to have transferred over to large corporations. And it was a strategic uh, decision by this premier. And I think that the environment's very different. Um, you know, I don't think anyone... When I was a school board trustee, the Toronto District School Board in 2003 um, had a budget of $1.6 billion. You know, when I left, uh, when in 2008, I think it was about three, $3.2, $3.3 billion. So there was a, a, a trajectory of, of investment, uh, cooperation, and moving into things like healthcare and just support services all around that may not go right into the education system, but supported young people. This government is on a completely different pathway and um, you know, I don't think uh, I don't think they could justify any of these cuts. Alvin, you got kids in school. Yeah. <clears throat> well, what point does your parent hat come on, and you say these kids got to get back to school? No, and I don't think you ever want to take tools out of the toolbox. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you just want to make sure the deal is fair. And as uh, as Michael said in the past, we felt that we had exhausted all avenues. And I think if the government is bargaining in good faith, and they have a reasonable. Uh, proposal on the table, something that an arbiter might have also said that this is what we should be doing, then at the end of the day, yes, it is important that uh, our kids are learning in school. But we have to exhaust those things, and we're nowhere near exhausting those options yet. You know... Kate? If you go and talk to teachers on the picket line, the things that they are fighting for right now, the number one thing that comes up is about class sizes. Mm -hmm. 
And they talk about, you know, I was surprised to learn during this campaign that for kindergarten teachers, one of their top concerns is violence in the classroom because there are students there that need additional support. And when you don't have enough adults in the room, uh, really unfortunate things can happen both for teachers and for students. Uh, if you've ever been to a like a birthday party with 10 five-year-olds, like an hour in, you're like, oh my goodness, uh, I cannot imagine the pressure that teachers are under. You should come and to so, my house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, we need to stand united beside teachers in this fight. Uh, given what this fight is about, we are entering into a time where there will be more people who are retired than in the workforce for the first time ever. Mm. Students today have to be very ready for that pressure. This is not the time to be putting education under threat. I stand with teachers in this fight. I am glad that they are fighting for things like a reasonable ratio of teachers to students. It is a fight worth having. Well, now that you've put it in my self-interest, I understand it. I do need my <laughs> retirement paid for by somebody. <laughs> Uh, and we can't, forget, we can't forget the education workers, too, though, in this. Like, that's yes, a big yeah. part of it is the education workers. And we talk yeah. about violence in the classroom. Um, you know, those are the frontline workers who were preventing that before they were uh, summarily uh, reduced or dismissed. Okay. Watching this campaign and listening to you today, you're all talking about change, which is natural because we're having a leadership. And we lost <laughs> an election. So change is obviously the natural thing. I'm not being critical about that. Um, not even the littlest bit defensive about it either. Um, <laughs> Do you have another commercial? <laughs> um, you're talking about change. You're talking about needing to hear what people told us in the election campaign. Okay. So I, I need to hear a specific about this. Other than the sale of Hydro One, name a win government policy you disagreed with. I can. Okay, go. Uh, auto insurance. Okay. Uh, between 2010 and 2018, there were 17 changes to auto insurance in Ontario. Uh, and 16 of those changes adversely affected Ontarians and positively impacted the auto insurance industry. There was one change that was okay for... You're, you're incorrect. My briefing notes told me... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, you're getting to the point. So... Um, so a, a very dramatic thing that happened, this is the best example, but this is a very small, uh, this is the tip of the iceberg. In, in 2015, if you had had a car accident and you became uh, catastrophically injured, let's say you're quadriplegic, you would have had $100,000, or sorry, a million dollars for um, healthcare, medical assistance, anything not covered by OHIP, remodeling your home, putting in ramps, buying your wheelchair, buying an accessible vehicle, a million dollars for that. And you would have had a million dollars for attendant care, someone to help you because mm. you can't use your arms and legs. That a million dollars for attendant care, if you're quadriplegic, lasts about 10 years. Most of the people who become quadriplegic in car accidents, they're in their 20s. So by the time you're 40 in 2016, that money was gone. Uh, the last liberal government halved that. They put uh, the $2 million into one. Why did they do that? Well, the promise was they were going to reduce auto premiums. Yeah. That did not happen. Auto premiums have continued to go up. There is not one person in Ontario who experienced a decrease in their premiums. And the answer, when pressed about it, we all know what the answer was. That was a stretch goal. And that's where the famous stretch goal came from, was that auto insurance mistake. Um, but, okay, you didn't get the premiums down, but you never returned the coverage. So there are people, just everyday people, who are impacted by a car accident who in 2014 would have had $100,000 to uh, look after themselves. Now they have $3,500. Right. I'm going to give you two. Okay. Right. I, I'm gonna give you you want to argue with me, though. I want to hear your no, argument. Because you. <laughs> good gonna, luck. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you two. Um, so... Very supportive of rising, raising the minimum wage. Um, you know, I represent uh, a riding in Scarborough Guildwood that has huge disparity in terms of income on campaign 2000. We're like number 13 for child poverty. So I get that we need to increase the minimum wage. It's the rapidity in which that policy was implemented along with the other labor reforms. So having been a small business owner, I, I was an entrepreneur who had a small business with a small number of employees, that's a lot to take. 
when you have so much change, a 30% increase in your payroll, but you don't really know who to go to to talk to about those changes in terms of, are we paying for this holiday or not? I had small business owners asking me that question. And so I felt that while we were doing a really important thing to spread the income and, and the gains that we had made in our economy to more people, it's the right policy, but the implementation could have been better. Um, I also really felt uh, that our 2018 campaign, we were relying on running on a budget and not a platform. And, you know, it's very complicated for everyday Ontarians to digest that budget. But we should have taken the time to have a platform that could have been explained at the door. And I felt that those were things that we should have corrected. Okay. Kate? Um, Other than the sale of Hydro One, what did you disagree yeah. with the wind government uh, well, about? Well, just one comment on Mitzi's point uh, about the minimum wage, about it being too fast. I actually think it was way too slow. Uh, there are many parts of Ontario where a living wage, you know, in London it's $15.50. In Toronto, I think it's well above $17 now. The amount that someone would reasonably need to be able to make uh, just to be able to afford basics, when we are paying people below that and we have people experiencing poverty and homelessness and we're somehow surprised that that continues, you know, I was really glad to see uh, moving forward with the basic income pilot, really glad to see Um, shifts towards increasing the minimum wage, but I think that should have happened much, much faster in the mandate. Uh, The thing that I would change, though, is uh, I was really glad to run for a party that had made historic investments in transportation, but they were way too concentrated in one part of the province, being the GTA, which has big transit needs, don't get me wrong. But in the rest of the province, uh, we have largely unconnected communities where people are sitting in single-occupant vehicles because they have no other choice Um, One little story, when I was a director at the City of London, when we were pushing for our rapid transit plan, we'd spent about $3 million getting this plan ready. I'd memorized every left turn lane, went in to meet with the Minister of Transportation, and, uh, you know, sat... Who was that? (laughs) 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 Does it start with an S? (laughs) (laughs) Went in to have this meeting... (laughs) It's not lost on us, yes. And uh, we're meeting with a very senior... You're not supporting him, so it must not have gone that well. Well, it didn't go that well, I'll say. Uh, We're meeting with a senior member of his team. It was the mayor and I. And he said, hey, it's early in the morning. How'd you get here so fast? And we said, we took the train. And he said, there's a train that goes to London? And I said, there's like 12 trains a day that go to London. But it was not lost on me that, you know, this was a person we were looking for approval from. And there was not a chance on earth that he knew more about London's transit needs than we do. But wait a it minute, was back, years back me up, later ministers, I thought happened. the infrastructure fund yeah. was split yeah. 50-50 between the GTA and the rest of the province. And I was going to yeah. jump in on that because, you know, the, the Kathleen, in all fairness, it was a $190 billion fund right. for infrastructure. And we made investments in Kitchener. We made investments in Hamilton and Ottawa. Like, we made massive investments into transportation in many parts of Ontario. So I think to say it was only concentrated or mostly concentrated in the GTA is not a fair um, a fair assessment. We also have to realize that, you know, the, the, the traffic in the GTA uh, it represents about uh, $6 billion in lost productivity revenue and half of the wealth of this province is generated in the GTA. Mm. So, you know, people, you know, people tell me all the but you time. You are cleverly answering a different question yeah. Yeah, than the one that we're on. And it's very right. skillful of you. It's why you're a good politician. But I mean, I mean, yeah, that's, but so, the, that's question, so, the question is yeah. we both disagreed with Kate. Yeah. Right? We both disagreed with Kate, but you're, you're, the question to you is what do you disagree with about the wind government? Well, You're you talking know, about change and so we need to do different. I agree with Mitzi, and um, I don't think Mitzi's point, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mitzi, Mitzi's point was that, um, you know, we shouldn't have raised it to 14 or $15. The point was that the time period over the course of a year was too too quick. We should have done it back, you know, seven years ago and got to that $15 mark, and I think, which is Kate's point. The, the big challenge is back in 2008, 2009, you know what was happening. We were in a massive recession you know, the worst recession in almost 100 years in this province. And it, c- companies were just not prepared to, to make those changes. And in fairness, you know, uh, when we got into uh, power in 2003, the minimum wage was, what, 640? And then Greg Saber brought it up to 1025. Kathleen brought it to 1185. And then she did the big push because she said the economy is actually doing well. So I agree with Mitzi's point. The other thing that, in retrospect, and this is in retrospect, not based on, 
you know, uh, uh, me at the time because, you know, it was, you have to look back to see these things and have a clearer perspective. But, you know, the sex ed curriculum, I agreed with it 100%. I think our implementation was off with um, with a lot of Ontarians, you know, different communities that are out there. And I think about it often, like, what could we have done differently? And, you know, I think there were six major units to it. Maybe it would have been better for us to introduce, you know, the one section at a time, talk about, you know, in section A, you know, talk about uh, consent or body parts and, you know, and slowly bring it in. Because what we found afterwards is that people didn't understand, no matter what we said to people, mm. People did not, the ones who were against it could not understand where we were going, even though the policy today is very similar to what, you know, we put out and we know it was the right thing to do because the world changed. Um, so that was the second piece. I think sometimes, you know, Kathleen used to say all the, t she used to say this and you, you know, of course you remember that people tell me I should slow down. Do you remember she used to say mm -hmm, that? Mm -hmm. And say, I'm not slowing down because there's so much stuff we need to do here in Ontario. And I think the point was, and again, this is in retrospect, because if, if I was in her position, I would go as fast as possible to get things done because we were behind him anyways. Her point was uh, that we need to get these things done, but for Ontarians, uh, they didn't have a time to truly understand a lot of the policy we're putting forward. And at the end, the communication exercise was off because people didn't understand what we were putting up or they just tuned out because there was so much stuff coming forward. There was a lot of, a lot of priorities on our agenda and people just got, you know, they lost out on understanding those things. So that's some of the things I would probably focus on if I had to go back in time. Alvin? I, I liked the platform around universal childcare, about adding the extra 18 months uh, for, for kids up to two and a half. Uh, from what I understand from people I've talked to in the government, we had an opportunity to implement that program earlier on. And we would have had a larger window to run on that particular policy. And I think you look back at how we benefited electorally from full day kindergarten. What you need to do with your ideas is not just talk about them as ideas, but if we're in government, implement as much as we can. So that as soon as the next election comes around, you're taking something away from people. Right? The basic income pilot only affected the four communities that it was in. If we were expanding that and more people received that, mm. it would have been much harder for Ford to get rid of it. I don't know if I agree with that, yeah. uh, Alvin, because what I see is this government under Ford, uh, even if there are things that, that were implemented, like the OHIP Plus for young people, um, they've taken that away. I've been on campuses where young women in particular have said, like, you know, it's taken away choice from them and their own personal safety because they can no longer get the medications that they need in in a way that doesn't involve them going to their, their parents for their their um, insurance coverage and that sort of thing. So it's it's something that, look at OSAP, right? Um, yeah. 700, but it wasn't universal, first, I think, was the His problem. first budget, I remember this uh, conversation with the, the minister, $750 million taken out of post-secondary education and really on the backs of students. Right. And, uh, yeah. and so, you know, it's only now that students are realizing, wow, that liberal government was really assisting me in my post-secondary education. And, uh, and so, they, yeah. you know, there are a lot of people that are impacted by the cuts that Ford is making. I, I want to say as liberals, uh, it's important for us to, to really call this government on what they're doing and, and to actually, I think it's important that the next leader is someone who has a seat because, you know, when you look at how much they are spending, their last budget was $5 billion more than our last budget people are getting less programs and less services, even with the the increase in spending. Mm. Just a last week- That's all week, the counting though, just, isn't it? <laughs> no, the real dollars. Mm. And last week they've increased because they've moved the hydro cost from the rate base to the tax base. And they're like, oops, it's gonna cost us 40% more than we budgeted. So it's $5.6 billion. Revenues in this province, because of a strong economy, because of the liberal policies that we're talking about here, that's driving this economy, revenues have increased by $3 billion. Yet the deficit is still the same at $9 billion. So this conservative government is spending money covering over their mistakes with our money as taxpayers, and we need to hold them accountable for that. Okay. So, but when I follow Del Duca, <laughs> when I followed Del Duca's campaign, it sounds to me like he thinks the wind government was too left wing. Is that basically how it sounds to you yes. when you're out there in the campaign trail? 
Yes. Do you think the wing government was too left wing? I think he said that in the OREA debate. Yeah. Okay. So who agrees with him? Anybody agree with him? I strongly disagree. You strongly disagree? Yep. Uh, the policies that we were running on in the last campaign were very popular. People liked the minimum wage. They wanted to see more investment in transit and mental health. The policies were not the problem. And uh, I don't I don't think the issue is that we lean too far to the left. I think it's we went too deep into the halls of Queen's Park. We stopped listening to people. We lost touch with them. So the policies were not the issue. Elvin, were we too left wing? No, I don't think so. Uh, but I also don't think we're going to win the next election by fighting Doug at Queen's Park, right? Like we have to get out there and 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 talk to Ontarians where they are and talk about their issues. Um, I think we ran on the right policies, but we alienated people at the same time, right? We talked about the minimum wage just now, and we talked about it as uh, about 15 and fairness, about um, if you are a good employer, you will pay your employees the right living wage. Mm. And I ran in Oakville. I ran in Oakville, North Burlington. There are a lot of small business owners who say, right. why are you attacking me? Why are you right. making me feel like a bad person? I like liberal policies as well, but I need you to understand that there's a process to this and why are you throwing me under the bus? I'm con- trying to contribute and help my family and this and the other thing. So if we talked about it as this is how we grow our economy, right? That we're, we're adding two and a half, three billion dollars to the economy by raising the minimum wage over these number of years or whatever it is. That's going to be better for your company. That's going to be better for your business. We actually tactically wanted a fight over that issue. Right. We were looking for a fight. Over that issue. Uh, and uh, the Chamber of Commerce gave it to us, but nobody else, everybody else was too smart uh, yeah, to give it to us. Pardon? Tim Hortons. Tim Hortons Tim gave Hortons it to us, and that was me. one of our better moments. So, Well, not, not from it, the perspective of business owners, though. I mean, there are a lot of sm- small and medium-sized enterprises that really lost faith, liberals who lost faith in the liberal government. I mean, I'm a business owner. We're right. not in the minimum wage bracket, but a lot of our suppliers are, and we had a lot of uh, conversations with people who that, that change, although necessary and although a strong policy, people need to make a living wage, it was very hard on business owners. And when they spoke up, they were vilified. Maybe nobody feels sorry for the small, uh, the Tim Hortons um, corporation, but there is some room to have some sympathy for small, uh, Tim Hortons franchise owners. Like it, it is a big thing to suddenly have the rug pulled out from under you. If you've got this business that's based on paying a certain amount and all of a sudden, and your whole business model is based on- But there were no the job cheap- losses. I mean, there's been uh, nothing no, but so, job so, right, but the point was um, they had an adjustment period, right? right? And, and they had no support during that. And when they spoke up, hey, this is hard, and what are we going to do? Maybe we're going to cut breaks. Bad idea, but trying to problem solve on the fly, they were vilified instead of helped. Yeah. Like, look, here are some strategies. We realize it's hard. Mm-hmm. Like, if I were the leader as a business owner, I would never have taken on Tim Hortons the way Kathleen Wynn did. I know she got some cheers, and it's easy to take to make fun of Tim Hortons because of what they are and who they are. But every time uh, Tim Hortons was mocked by the Liberal government, every other small business owner felt it. And you can think you're taking on Tim Hortons, but you're also taking on, um, you know, the print shop on Main Street and the the shoe repair company um, on Maple Street. Like, we all felt it. I mean, I, as I say, I wasn't in that bracket, but I'm in that demographic as a business owner, and I felt it. So, so I see a lot of people want to comment on this. I just want to, <laughs> well, wait, 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 I just want to put it in a, a little bit of a frame. I just want to put it in a, because this is a really important question, I think. So Bill 148 both raised the minimum wage to $14 in 2018 and then supposed to be $15 in 2019. And the second thing, uh, it had a whole list of new protections for workers that are the kinds of things that, to my eye, no worker should be denied those things that were on that list. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of things that unions used to automatically negotiate for people, and now that you're not unionized, those things don't right. exist. So it was an updating of the Employment Standards Act. Right. I haven't heard anybody in this race commit to reintroducing that legislation. Uh, we have talked about it. A few mm-hmm. of us have talked about certainly yes. the um, the sick days that were taken away. That's come up a couple of times in the right. context of the coronavirus and the sick notes. I mean, that's just ridiculous to require people to go into a busy doctor's office to get a sick note. That's come up. Maybe not the whole bill, but a number of the elements. Where uh, are you at on the bill? Yeah, I support the bill. And uh, like I 
brought this debate about, you know, minimum yeah. wage and Bill 148 and, and its implementation. And it's certainly not the substance. So, you know, before entering politics at, as a CEO of Civic Action, I support a $15 minimum wage and for people, you know, being paid a fair wage. And, and I absolutely support that. What I had issue with was it's, it's the rapidity in the implementation, which uh, was it in the best interest of the worker and the employer, or is it was it in our own sort of political expediency? And I think that that's something that we have to contend with. Bill 148, um, absolutely, there are aspects to that bill, like the sick days and um, you know, making sure that that workers are protected, in a, particularly in a modern gig economy where you know workplaces are are not the same as it was before. We need those protections for workers, their safety. But you know, we we can slow down. We can break it up. We can actually work with the business community in implementing it. We don't have to be in opposition. Uh, I do want to answer the question of where I am on that that spectrum because I think that there is a good place in the middle for us as liberals. Um, you know, Brenda had said earlier that the values that we see in Ontario are aligned with the values in this party. You know, people expect to have, you know, good public education, health care, and, uh, and reasonableness when it comes to employment, right? We've actually benefited from a strong economy. So the changes that we saw in the rise in the minimum wage and in, in labor uh, reform, it did not lead to the shedding of jobs. Uh, that, that was a good thing. Our timing was very good from an economic standpoint. Um, but Economy comes in cycles, and uh, and I believe the leader of this party needs to make sure that we're sensitive to that and sensitive to the needs of business, who are the employers as well. Thanks. Michael, would you bring back Bill 148? You know, anything, any, there's a lot of bills that fit into certain categories that are so attached to the state of the economy. I honestly don't know what the, the world's going to look like two years from now in Ontario. And um, I, I know that... Um, uh, when implementing uh, drastic shifts like that, um, I agree with Brenda that you know stability is something that businesses are looking for and predictability in Ontario. So I can't really answer the question, but um, I believe in uh, the essence of what that bill stood for. Um, speak to who I am and what I fight for, and uh, and I do believe that the affordability issue and the ability to you know, to the dignity piece around being able to take a sick day and get paid for or something that, you know, resonates deeply with Ontarians and it's part of our value sets as, as, as Ontarians. I just want to talk a little, just if, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk a little bit about that political spectrum that's come up a few times. And I've said this uh, uh, often during these discussions that, you know, it's very difficult for us as a party today or as I think as a politician to say, this is where I sit on the political spectrum you know, center, left, right. Because it's really, when you think about the policies that we have, and I, I use this example, like, you know, when it comes to economics and the debt management revenue, you know, I would consider myself as center as, as possible. Try to do good things, good social programs, be responsible with your money. When it comes to the environment, I'm very progressive, you know, would be maybe considered very left-leaning. When it comes to education, you know, I believe in literacy, numeracy, and the traditional approach to education, which may be seen as conservative. I think that that spectrum and placing ourselves is, is not really to our advantage as liberals. And it really just brings me back to thinking of, you know, like, Richard Nixon and, you know, that old style of politics, or I'm the, you know, I'm the right, I'm the center, I'm the left. And the world has become so complicated today that it is very hard to place a political party uh, on that spectrum. We have to think in practical terms and address issues as they come forward based on our values. Okay. I want to get a quick word from Kate and Elvin on this, and then I want to actually <laughs> pin down that point on a finer note. So, Kate, you've been trying to get in. Uh, well, I just wanted to talk about the minimum wage, and I think uh, Brenda's point was very well made around what Thank that you. relationship looks like with <laughs> small businesses. And to me, this is the classic example of where the problem is not the policy, the problem is the politics of it. So in the last election, people would always say, it feels like you're buying my vote. So much in that budget, and it felt like it was motivated by winning an election. You know, when you talk to small business owners, they are good people. A lot of them love their employees. They want to see their employees do well. I don't think the issue was about the number. Again, it felt like the motivation was about winning an election instead of coming as a result of a long conversation with business owners about changes that need to be made. I do think the, you know, 
I'm very proud to run for a party that I think was making significant strides. I've already said I think it was too slow, but the way that it happens, it cannot be tied to electoral outcomes. It has to be tied to long, sustained conversations where it's predictable, people know what's coming, we're not catching them by surprise, and it doesn't seem like we're ma making decisions based on the election that's coming up. We lose people when it's, they can smell it a mile away. We've got to stop doing that. I don't know why. So wait, I mean, oh. we, we got to move on because no. we're running out of time. And I have, oh, Alvin, you didn't get a Yeah, I'll talk really quick. And I do talk too fast. I, I hear that often. But um, it's, so I'm a progressive. I will unabashedly say I am progressive. And I think most liberals are progressive. And we win elections because we have progressive policies. But the, what makes us uniquely liberal is that we have a pragmatic way of implementing that. How do we separate ourselves from the NDP is very important because they have lofty goals, but no practical way of implementing it. Michael was right. We talk about pragmatism in our plans. And when the electorate sees that we're moving away from that, like Kate just said, to, it makes it feel like we're trying to just win votes, but we don't have a, a real practical way of doing that, that makes people understand and come with us, then we lose their trust because of that. Okay. So people think that the uh, win government that you were part of was a, a big spending government. But as we know, Ontario is the lowest spending provincial government per capita in Canada. Right? Mm -hmm. And after probably a decade of restraint under McGinty and Wynn, right, uh, we technically balanced the budget in 2018, but without a single additional dollar of spending, the deficit would have been $4 billion the next year. That's a, a, there's a structural imbalance here. And my question to you, which gets back to this, a little bit to the spectrum question, is whether your approach to dealing with the finances of the province would be to raise taxes and revenue because we have a revenue problem post the Mike Harris government in this province, not a spending problem, but a revenue problem in this province, or would your uh, or would your uh, uh, would your position be to uh, uh, cut spending? in areas in order to balance the budget, something we get criticized about uh, and, and continues to be a vulnerability out there, the debt and deficits around Ontario? Or would you be uh, less concerned about deficits? The United States is running a trillion dollar annual deficit. Feds are running you know, $20, $30 billion annual deficits. Nobody seems to care about these things anymore. Um, so would, would your attitude be, I'm gonna, I've got ambitious things I wanna do, I'm gonna raise revenue, I've got ambitious things I'm going to do. I got to wait till the economy generates enough money for that to happen, or I'm going to ambitious things to do, and I'm just going to do them and damn the torpedoes deficit was. So can I can I answer that first? If yeah. It's okay. Um, so Irene Atkinson was a trustee at the Toronto District School Board. I don't know if you ever met Irene. No. Incredible uh, politician for uh, 20, 30, 30 years at the school board. She used to say something that was so interesting. She would say, "There's a cost to standing still." And what she meant by that is every year we put more money into the budget and uh, nothing changed. Even though we added more money, nothing changed. So in Ontario today, even when we add 2 3% every single year into the budget, nothing. the systems, the major systems don't change because deferred maintenance in our school systems, what, we've got $16.5 billion on the books uh, probably another third, uh, another uh, fifteen million that's unaccounted for in renewal and other deferred maintenance that's not registered. You know we have, and that's just our schools. You know, thirty to forty billion dollars of required maintenance money in our schools, five thousand schools across the province, our hospitals, our highways. We are living on borrowed money in this province to keep up to to maintain a system that we have. In addition to that, uh, we keep adding more money, a couple of billion dollars to healthcare and education. Nothing changes because of inflation and things like that. So my plan would be this. I would commit not to raising personal income taxes. That would be the first thing for the first four years. Second thing is I would do a complete audit to figure out who's pay paying their fair share of taxes, major corporations like the Amazons and Googles, to figure out are they actually paying taxes? And if not, let's get them paying the taxes. If you do business in Ontario, you pay for it. But what I would commit to would be the first half of the mandate to explore the future, the next 40 years in Ontario. Where are we actually going? What are the pressures that are here? Where's our revenue? What is the cost of borrowing? Um, you know, what can we expect with current trends with the changing economy? And I would come back to Ontarians after two years with a, uh, a series of uh, data points 
and options and ask Ontarians, what do they want? Where do they want to go? Those days of robots. No, I would I would do it through uh, through uh, town halls by talking to people and getting a sense of where people want to go. But the big question would come down to this. I don't know if you this. watched Kathleen Wynne's town halls, but they didn't seem ideal for <laughs> <We> would, rational <laughs> discourse. We would do every we would do everything we possibly could. We would do everything we possibly could to actually have a real conversation, a realistic conversation, because I believe the current trajectory here in this province has us hitting a wall in a decade or two, and no one's talking about the next. 30 years, 40 years. We're thinking we're thinking in four-year political cycles, and it's a very dangerous place for us to be. And we, at the end of the day, if we put together an option, plan for Ontarians when we share the information and actually share it in a, in a real way and put the problem on the table, we can go back to Ontarians and say, what are your expectations for government? What are you expected to put into the pot to keep this going? And let's have a real conversation. And I think that's been missing for decades in this province. So, but unless the world has entirely rotated on its axis, they will tell you that they want more and yeah. for you to take less. Right. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and then you present the, the information, say, well, if that's the case, this is what actually will happen. And I think, I think, I think Ontarians don't understand. Uh, in many ways, there's many Ontarians that don't understand how serious our problem is in this province. But you're not going to be able to explain it to them. That's the Why? Thing, Why not? Right? Because that's not how it works. Yeah. It sounds a little like the Drummond report, but, you know... So if we look at the 15 years that we were in power and in government and we look at Ontario's and Michael's right, like we had a global recession in the 08, 09, mm. in the middle of that, we've gone 12 years of, you know, you know, positive uh, uh, GDP and, and growth. So these things come in cycles. At some point, there's going to be a downturn. And, um, you know, we may be the ones that have to contend with that for, okay. for people. You know, we have to make sure that people have jobs and they can put food on their table and keep a roof over their head while we provide services. And so, you know, the need for a deficit um, may be there based on the strength of the economy. But if we're doing the things that are right, like making the investments in education and good quality health care and infrastructure that's spread as Kate has said, uh, across key areas in this province, uh, we we have a, an outlook for Ontario that is a bright future for, for the people of this province. So for me, it's about maintaining that balance. It's making sure that we don't have, we don't take on so much debt that we cannot affordably service that debt. Mm -hmm. It's making sure that, you know, when the rating agencies take a look at us, that we continue to have high grade, right? So that the cost of our debt is manageable. And you're right. We have the lowest per capita spending in terms of programs, but we also have the lowest per capita in terms of revenues as well. So we're not in a state in Ontario where we're taking more than we're providing in terms of services. I think as liberals, we have to dispel the myth that we're not good fiscal managers. Right. That is a myth. And the fact that the conservatives are, I've already told you, you know, $3 billion increase in revenue deficit is still at $9 billion. They've done nothing to bring that down. And, uh, and you know, we don't, we need to kind of take our place as, uh, they're, they're as just fiscal part of their stewards. Brand, though, Mitzi, right? <laughs> I mean, because they're generally seen as miserly and mean to people, they're also assumed that they're to be good money managers. Like Scrooge. Right? No. Yeah. And, and but we have to Ellen, highlight, we have to highlight when they're making these kind of mistakes, right? Yeah. And like yeah. these, these uh, lack of investment is actually hurting us in the future. And I think you can make an argument that, yeah, we should have plans to get back to balance. But this is why we need to increase revenue is to fund these programs so they'll actually make it better, right? We talk a lot about uh, fighting poverty and, 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 and the idea of a basic income when you look at the fact that we lose four billion dollars a year in our healthcare system. My wife works in a hospital just down the street. Every day people come into the hospital who don't need to be there. And they're there because they're poor. They're there, they need somewhere to stay, they need something to eat. We waste billions of dollars on that. We send criminals uh, and we spend sixty to $150,000 a year and they're crimes of poverty. 75% of women who are uh, incarcerated are there because of poverty. And we know what the solution is. We need to 
make the argument that this proposal is a better way of spending our social assistance dollars. It's a better way. And there are conservatives who understand that. People like Hugh Siegel who say, yeah, a basic income makes way more sense than the system we currently have. And we have to make that discussion and have that argument with people. Okay. Um, I need to move on and I want to talk to you, uh, ask you just a couple of questions about your approach to being leader of the Liberal Party um, in, in addition to pr the Premier's responsibilities that we've been talking about. Uh, my preamble to this will be that uh, when I got involved um, in the central campaign in 2013, I was shocked by the weakness of the riding associations um, and uh, how much the volunteer wing of the party had atrophied. I found an incredibly competent, well-trained cadre of staffers at Queen's Park that were the heart of a very professional operation. And outside of that, nothing. And uh, I think that got worse between 2013 and 2018. So I'm not claiming that it's the fault of people before me. I think it got worse and, and while I was uh, involved. So what is your approach to rebuilding that? What is your approach to making people care about being involved in their writing. What's the point of being a writing president, for example? Anybody want to yeah, jump in? Yeah, I'd take love to on? jump in on this because, you know, one of the challenges I've put out there is to knock on a million doors. And the whole uh, premise of that is getting out, out of whatever perceived center we have in this party and going to the doors as liberals and having conversations with people in their communities and reawakening those grassroots and those volunteers who will be the ones out doing the, the data collection and gathering information in between the elections. I also feel that we need to have regional offices, you know, in the Southwest, in Eastern, so that people can have a response from their party that doesn't have to go through one bottleneck. I also want to see regional caucuses. So we have six, uh, six members of caucus right now. Hopefully, February 27th, we'll have eight, and that's good. Mm. But unless there are other by-elections in our future in the next two and a half years, I want to see regional networks set up that can help to inform the decisions that we're making, uh, both as a party and as a caucus, and so that the, the voice of this party is coming from the grassroots not the top down. Super. So, <laughs> so I was shooting you like rage eyes as you're asking this question uh, for people listening. So the idea that outside of the staff team at Queen's Park that there was nothing uh, does not reflect at all my observations of this party. So when you go riding by riding, what you find is people who are committed liberals. They've been in this for a long time. They have given their heart and soul to the party. And it didn't really matter because nobody was listening to them. You find that when you say, hey, I'm going to join my riding association, you are invited to go to an AGM, you know, vote on some motions. When election time comes, you know, hey, friend, can you chip in five bucks? And can you go and make some phone calls for us? No meaningful opportunity to shape the direction the party was going. Nobody's asking, hey, you know what life is like in Perth or in Temiskaming Shores or wherever better than we do. What is it that you want to see from our party and from the future of this province? Nobody was asking them that. So I don't think the problem is that there was nothing, nobody out there. The problem is that we were not talking to them. We weren't listening to them. They didn't have any meaningful role to play in the party. That was the issue. Elvin? I mean, what's the value of a membership right now, right? And what has it been in the last 15 years, especially with a professional staffer class that I've seen come in, they take over the riding association, they, you know, stifle some debate and say, this is what we're running on, right? And your role as a member is to show up uh, every four years and vote and take a sign and, and make a knock on some doors. They need more value to that, right? And I think what Mitzi was talking about with one member, one vote, and when I proposed free memberships and online voting and... Everybody's been talking about how we need to have these policy conventions again, which we haven't had in over 10 years. It's about having that relationship that Kate's talking about, how people have a feedback loop and that there's an opportunity for them to get involved. We relied so much on the staff and that when the staff eventually overturned and I mean turned over and we got new staff that didn't really care about politics or the history of the party, 
look at the election result we got in the last election. People weren't there oh, on the ground. Else's fault. Yeah. No, <laughs> well, the staff, no, it's the, the staff were great though. This is not about like mm. either or, right? Yeah. Staff play a really important role, but so do people who are, you know, the longtime committed person who cares about the community they live in, and that's why they're involved in politics. If there's one or two issues they care about, yeah. that's why they're there. But we it's, need to give them more both. opportunities to get involved in a meaningful way, right? That's mm-hmm. not just please knock on doors and give me money. Okay, there's the also um, sort of basic nuts and bolts. So when I went to my uh, association's um, board meeting, I heard all of the ugly stuff like, we don't know how to put any events on the fir- on the um, website of the party, so we can't have any events. We don't know how to set up a Facebook page and get it authorized, and I've tried to call the party, and nobody's yeah. calling me back, so we can't have a Facebook page. And um, there, there were no events from my association relating to the leadership. Um, and there is a full board. We are constituted because they don't have the tools. I mean, we put on an event. I know some of you put on events, but there was no uh, association event because they just don't have the tools. And we're talking about the ability to put things on a website and the ability to access Facebook and get it approved by the party. So things that cost nothing. I go to other riding associations, mostly in eastern Ontario, and it's the same thing. Their uh, their website page is blank, and they have no Facebook page. So just the complete inability, and they feel that they are unable to get the support from the party headquarters. You call and nobody calls back, or you call and the voicemail is full. Um, that's the worst, right? Um, our LEM location was set yesterday. Yeah. Right. They're pretty skeletal in there right yeah. now. Yeah. Right. No, and that's and not going to be a challenge for any right. of you. Yeah. Is you're going to have very, very well, which few is why so you need the volunteers yes. feeling right. empowered. Yes. That's We've right. got to empower the grassroots in yes. this party, not yep. to seek permission to set up exactly. a Facebook page, but to set yeah. it up. Yeah, and that to was start my talking that's my point. Right. It isn't that that they're slow to get back. It's that do you really need the party's approval to set up a Facebook page? That's that's or really to send the point. A tweet. Yeah. You know that it's it's that it's not that they should be doing it faster. Of course, there's very few of them, but it's just like let's give them some power. And you know, if they do, if they make a mistake, you tell them, you fix it. That's right. Delete. Okay. Trust them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the role of PLAs have changed over the last uh, several decades. You know, there was a point I was reading once in uh, Ontario history, a book about you know when a when a nomination took place, the president of the PLA signed off on the nomination to put forward the candidate. You know, we've come way, in it. like it's very different today. Uh, I come from, uh, you know, Don Valley East. Uh, my predecessor was David Kaplan, and uh, he set a good culture within our organization to keep people active. We've always been an active uh, PLA. We meet 10 times a year. We take a break in the summertime. So I come from that that type of um, uh, political PLA culture. Um one thing um, I've noticed that being on the, the road, uh, like everyone else here, is that I'm starting to exercise a new political muscle that it, I wasn't there. You know, as a, you go in as a minister, you make an announcement, you shake hands with the mayor, you know, you hand over the check, uh, you may check in with one liberal and you move on. What we're doing basically right now is the rawest form of politics. Uh, and it is uh, it has opened up a whole new perspective for me. And I think back, you know, to my years uh, at Queen's Park and I think, well, why wasn't I doing it like this? We are, we, we are doing things right now. Remember, we may have raised money, but, you know, none of us have money. Like, <laughs> we may raise money, but none of us have money to do what we really want to do. We're using. Know, you're well dressed. <laughs> we're using every single tool possible to, you know, to communicate, to get the message out, to push, you know, a narrative, to get exposure, and we're doing that on on a shoestring budget. Totally. You know, and I feel like, you know, I look at like the guys I grew up with in my neighborhood in Flemington Park, and you know. Um, People used to make music like, you know, like hip hop music and how resilient and how they could monetize something out of nothing, really, right? You know, bro- a couple of records and the, the record player, a microphone and the beatbox, and they could actually monetize and create a billion dollar, you know, industry out of nothing. The cool thing about being a part of this Ontario Liberal Party today is that. Uh, we are nimble, we are efficient, because we don't have the money to do what we normally did. And I think this cleansing process is a good thing for liberals, 
And I think that we are setting the stage. And this is why I think all of us are so valuable in the future of this party, because the experience we're getting today is allowing us to do politics without the traditional resources necessary. And that's the new way of doing things. Can I just say, I think what Michael just said is so powerful and particularly well, thank being very you. honest. Thank you. You're now supporting Michael? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I, Can I, I put that out as an endorsement? <laughs> <laughs> Michael's ideas are powerful. <laughs> well, let me be clear. <laughs> I just, I think it's a really honest statement to say, you know, reflecting on time as a minister and we would go in and, you know, kiss the cheeks and sign the, or shake the hands and so on. And uh, the very different approach that is to going to a community and saying, I'm here to listen. You know, I'm not, it's not about a fancy show or a photo op. I'm here to hear Although from we you. we get the photo ops. Yes, there are still a lot of, yeah, there's still a lot of that for sure. But like, if that is the change that we can make in the party, it sounds so simple. But if we viewed our role less as being about going into communities and telling them what we're going to do for them and a lot more about showing up and saying, hey, you know what? Politics is a chance for you to change the things you want. I'm here to listen to you. I do not know more than you do about the place where you live or the problems that you face, but it, you know, I am very committed to doing everything that I can to help support you in solving those problems. If we can make that change as a party, we got a really big future ahead. Well, the That's the change. The we roving need. ambassadors that we are is pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. You know, all every community has had multiple people in it talking about what matters to people. No wonder we're yeah, up a lot in the of polls. communities have probably had more liberals. Yeah, and they said they haven't seen them in in, Ever. in forever. <laughs> yeah, but no. it also it also goes to the quality of our candidates and and whether or not we give free passes to people who potentially shouldn't be there anymore either. Can we right? talk about candidates? I, yeah, I want I want to introduce that subject. Yeah. Uh, it's my second organizational question for you. It's going to be a huge challenge. It's also related to writing organization because the yeah. lot yeah. of organization will occur around the candidacy or around the right. nomination of a candidacy. Mm -hmm. It's good to have a focal point mm -hmm. for organizing, but. Um, you're going to have to recruit well over 100 candidates um, um, and uh, find good candidates, convince them that they can win, get them motivated. And there's two things about that, one of which is I've heard various things in this discussion and throughout my entire life in the Liberal Party, I've heard various things about uh, quotas or about, uh, uh, about uh, you know, certain benchmarks we want to meet about the composition of the candidates that <laughs> like we 30 have. 30 under 30? 30 mm -hmm. under 30. That's the Del Duca proposal, yeah. right? But how are you going to fulfill and, and that? Well, so then, like, the, then the yeah. question is... That's actually the Young Liberals proposal from the 90s, federally. <laughs> really? 30 under 30. Uh, Fred Gasper, uh, Greg Fergus, a yeah. whole bunch, Rob uh, Jameson, they, they everyone all pushed all that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> idea you only think is a good idea when you're under 30. Right. But anyway... <laughs> um, <laughs> 30 in their 30s? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can take a couple of those seats. Yeah. Anyway, that would absolutely require appointments right. to get that done. In fact, any system of quotas or benchmarks requires appointments to get that done. If you want to say we're 50% female candidates, that's going to require appointments. If you want to say we're 30 under 30, you're going to be appointing 27 of those people, unless they're all running in the worst ridings in the province. So, right? What is your approach to candidate to putting together your state of candidates going to be, Kate? So, if we are serious about empowering riding associations, that is the level this needs to happen at. I'm not interested in a party where the leader is appointing more people. Um, I actually think we could take a cue from the NDP here. They have rules around we won't call a nomination until certain outreach has happened. So, there are groups that are underrepresented in politics women, young people, people with disabilities, um, people from the LGBTQ plus community, and so on. What we need to do is be more deliberately reaching out to people. You have to ask a woman to run seven times before she'll seriously start thinking about it. For a man, it's one time. That means the <laughs> amount of effort that we need to make to recruit women is that much higher. But I don't think that uh, necessarily requires appointments from the top. I think it requires tightening up our process at the grassroots level. The other thing I think we can learn from is what the Democrats did in the states before the last race. They opened it up and said, we know that candidates tend to come from kind of the inside baseball crew, somebody who knows somebody. If we want to get beyond that, we are going to open up and ask people in the community to nominate people they think would be great in politics. 
You know, a little boy nominated AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. My sister works in a taco shop, but she's really good at talking to people and she cares a lot about politics. You should talk to her. She was not envisioning running for politics and look at the transformative change she's making now. So we need to learn from examples where it's working. Uh, it doesn't have to require centralized control, but we do need to do a heck of a lot more when it comes to making sure that underrepresented groups uh, have a greater voice in politics. Elvin? I mean, you have a great opportunity right now, just like we did in the 2015 federal election, where people are going to look at the polls, they're going to see the parties on an upswing, and you're going to have a lot of people interested. But we need to make sure they're going at it at the right re for the right reasons, and we need to actively still recruit, right? We need to actively recruit people of color. We need to actively recruit women and say— you know, there is an opportunity for you to succeed here. But also, the OWLC has that um, uh, fund for Margaret. female candidates, yeah. Yeah. which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. But perhaps we should be supporting that more with other segments of, of, uh, of the population, right? And it should be more money. We should be uh, providing uh, people with more information. Like Brenda always talks about how there's no information about running as a candidate, not just you a leadership You know I'm going to have to answer. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> you know, people want to know what the process is and people want it to be transparent. I think the, the biggest frustration that I've heard from nomination contestants is that um, they think the, the rules are fixed um, and that uh, the party will ultimately decide who they want <clears throat> um, and that uh, it's, it's stacked against them. And I think we should get Well, that's ready. often true. Well, I think you, I mean, there's ways around that. Well, I think but, we need but to you get know what? It's often the flip side of, and if I could just say, it's often the flip side of appointments. Okay, right. and so you're all going to be, if you're the leader, and probably even if you're not, on the phone recruiting people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And there's certain types of candidates. I might call them star candidates. You might not like that term, but people who would be giving up something a sub of substance in order to run will take the risk of losing the election in their riding will not take the risk of losing the nomination, will mm -hmm. not leave their position in their profession in order to lose the nomination. So you can go at it two ways, three ways. One of which is you cannot get that candidate. The second thing is you can appoint that candidate, which is generally what I've done. The third thing is you can do what the Trudeau people did in 2015 and presumably with uh, other places in 2019, which is to pretend it's an open nomination, <laughs> yeah. but then throw every party organizer and resources into that writing to get the candidate that you want, <laughs> right? Christia Freeland might as well have been appointed, right, in, uh, in Toronto Centre for that by-election. So that's the reality. How do you intend to deal but with that reality? If they're not good no, enough to win a nomination, they're not good enough to win a general election. It's not a question election, of good enough. Right? If they're not organized yes. enough. Well, if, wait. They, if they're not willing to go well, through she won that, the election. Yeah, yeah they and won the election. Twice. Those are different skills. Those are different skills. And, and organize. I mean, listen. I'm the last person who's going to say organizing is underrated because I have learned what organizing is. Um, looking at what organizing is not, but it. Um, you can be an excellent uh, politician coming at it fresh and have no clue about the ground game. I mean, I've talked to you guys about how. I didn't know any of the stuff that happens behind the scenes. And most people who have the potential to be really interesting, um, diverse in the sense of diverse background candidates, aren't going to know how to organize a nomination. And, you know, like for me, giving up my law practice to do this for a couple months, I can do it because I own the law practice. But for somebody situated in a law firm that doesn't have the kind of freedom I have, I, I, I totally agree that you can't just um, give everything up on the hope of getting a nomination if you don't have a heck of a lot of support. So that, I mean, that's what I think you need to do is you have to make sure that if there's a candidate that you're interested in, there's a group of candidates that you're interested in, you have to at least make sure they know how to do it. Mm -hmm. And because I've been thinking about this for a decade off and on, and I would go and I would search and I would find out if I wanted to be run as a Democratic senator, I could do that if I, but I did not know how to run um, and I could not find it online. And I didn't know that you could just call up uh, the person in your riding and, and ask the questions because to me, politicians weren't people you phoned. And so making sure that people who are interested, people who would contribute something significant, have the tools or know how to get the tools and aren't learning on the job um, and, you know, maybe don't perform the way they could if they had the tools. Okay. Yeah. Michael, how are you going to approach putting your candidate slate together? 
is really about building the right team, right? You've got to get the diversity, not only based on things like gender and race and uh, proximity. Like You've got to be able to f- identify uh, the men and women and just people in Ontario who can actually help you build um, a, I would say, an approach to, uh, to running government, but also presenting an alternative to Doug Ford. I think the leaders should reserve the right to, I think, what is the rule? Five five yeah. spots right now? Mm-hmm. I would uh, maintain that. I think it's an important tool to use to to often find that balance within the team. And there are some circumstances where you need to, to use that. I'm not saying a leader has to use all five spots or any at all, but I think that's a, a thing that we should reserve uh, uh, to uh, provide as a tool to the leader as a party. Um, but it's really about building uh, the right type of team um, and uh, making sure you... Like, sorry, are you uh, is 50% women a given now? I think that any leader... So I know that Stephen's uh, committed to that, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Um, I've always said that it should always be the goal of a leader to find the balance within within the, the candidates. Um, and I think I think that there's so many there's so much more than just the gender diversity. There's you know there's the you know the, the what uh, education background, lived experience, um, work experience. There's so many elements to building that right team. And as you go along, you will know where your shortfalls are and where, you know, you're overrepresented. But it's right, it's about finding a balance. And I think, you know, there's been great examples of, of, of uh, politicians and leaders in the past that have been able to build good teams that they could present to Canadians or Ontarians to demonstrate that they've, they've got a handle of the challenges that are in front of them. You know, Kretchen was great at, at putting together a team of people. You know, I worked for John Manley. These guys, you know, these were people who were just like larger than life. I have the people, life. I have the plan, we will make the difference. <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't afraid to put people out in front to tackle the issues, right? And I think that's, what's, that's what leadership is all about, finding the right type of people that you can say, just go. You know, but, with Kathleen Wynne, for example, when I was a minister, you know, we wrote our own, people may not believe this, but we wrote our own mandate letters. You know, we uh, we sat down with the bureaucrats in the office and we we put together our plan yeah. and we presented it to the premier's office and nothing. I think there was maybe one out of like maybe 60 things that were were were, were changed or challenged by the office, but everything came from our office. That doesn't sound like the Andrew Bevan I know. <laughs> 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 but I mean that's that's real leadership. Let people let find good people and let them do their job. Got it. Yeah, so it's too bad that the sixth candidate is not here because most of the promises around 30 under 30 and 50% women as quotas, like we need to know how that's going to happen. Are we going to change the party rules for appointments above the five that are is currently in place? You know, what I believe, and I've said this um, even before um, running and, and, and getting in the race, is that we should have open and fair nominations for exactly how you've described this process. And I think that that goes to the heart of the culture of the party and the fact that we want to be an open party where people feel that things are happening in a fair and transparent way and that their voices are heard in this party. Um, When I talk to candidates um, who have ran for us in rural Ontario and in Actually, I was giving the rural example and someone said to me the other day, excuse me, our Toronto candidate got nominated a week after the writ. There's no excuse for that. We need to have our candidates in place, uh, ideally a year out before the 2022 election and, uh, and working the ground in communities to address some of the things that we had talked about earlier in terms of grassroots engagement and involvement. And yes, I believe that we do need to get those star candidates or those leaders in communities that people want to see uh, run for us as liberals. But I think we have a compelling case. We have the brand that speaks to a, the broadest spectrum of Ontarians and a party that um, you know has an excellent history. This is about the future of the party, and people want to be part of creating that change and shaping the future. So are you saying you wouldn't use the power of appointment? Uh, I would say the five that the the current party rules has in place is more than enough to give any kind of flexibility that we would have. But I've already committed to this open, fair nominations and let let the debate happen on the ground because that actually 
generates interest. You know, one of the things that people have said to me, though, like nobody called me after I ran for nomination. So it's almost as if we only embrace the person who won and the person who ran for the nomination is ignored. We need to actually embrace everyone who Mm. wants to be a liberal in our party. Interesting. Uh, I'm going to move into our short snapper round now. And here you are restricted to a sentence oh, to answer this. And I really we're only doing this because How many and what, and, and because what's... we are almost two hours into this debate in case time has been moving yeah. quickly. It's been two hours. Okay. Yeah, it's almost what, been two what's hours. What's the punishment if you go over? <laughs> well, the lava, know, lamp, the lava lamp. The lava lamp. You have to take the lava lamp. The lava lamp. You've got to endorse someone. So I'm going to go around on each of these and uh, everybody give me a quick answer. And the first one, I'm going to start with Alvin. Do you support the amalgamation of the Catholic and public school boards? <laughs> yes. Yes, I do. Uh, wholeheartedly. And why? Quickly, why? In one sentence, I yeah. think it's a more equitable way and we can create a better system by merging the best pieces out of both. Okay. You? Do you support the amalgamation? No. As former education minister, that's not the policy that I pursued and I don't think it's what's on the minds of parents and education workers at this moment. Do you support the amalgamation? It's not a priority. Doug Ford's dividing on Tyrans already. It's time for us to come together. I do not. After four years of Doug Ford, the last thing these students need is the kind of upheaval that that would create. No, I am opposed to any form of provincially forced amalgamations. Okay. <laughs> Basic income. Mitzi Hunter, do you support moving toward the moving toward uh, the establishment of a basic income in Ontario? Yes, I would reinstate the pilot. I want to know what those results are. I would look at comparative jurisdictions, and I would have a plan for implementing it. I think we need to have a system that prepares for the disruption and automation that is going to displace many Ontario workers, and we have to keep our economy and our community going. Basic income, Michael? Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good one. Uh, reinstate the pilot project for the reasons that Mitzi stated. We need to look at it, but I think it's an experiment worth doing. Okay. Okay. Definite yes. Uh, very much in favor, but think we need to do more to look at the fact that you know it costs different amounts to live in different parts of Ontario. Alvin. Yes, uh, 105,000 people over 16 pilots over, around the entire world uh, have shown us uh, what we need to know, including in Manitoba, where 8.5% decrease in hospital visits, 44% decrease in domestic violence, and an increase in graduation rates shows that we can do this right now. That was and that we need to do this right now. I had a guy sentence. on my podcast last week, a very <laughs> smart guy named John Stackhouse. He's the vice president of the Royal Bank of Canada. He's a thoughtful guy. He said he opposes basic income because of the moral hazard. He said that you do not want to create a useless class of people who sit around and collect checks. All the data, all the data shows that employment does not change. Seventy percent of people on social assistance, seventy percent of people who are on a basic income do not stop working. They continue to work. They just can't afford to continue moving on and contribute to society. They need this as an income floor. So I'm former vice president at Goodwill Industries about workforce development and people who are trying to get into the labor market, people with disabilities, people with perhaps addictions issues, et cetera. There is power is in work in terms of dignity and social inclusion. That will never go away. That's not what we're talking about here with respect to basic income. It's about just giving people a reliable, stable source of income so they can then get on with the other decisions in their lives. Um, You know, what training should I get? Uh, You know, how do I make sure that my family and my needs are met? So really like John Stackhouse, but... (laughs) He's not right on Poverty costs $33 billion a year. A basic income would cost half that. Excellent. Okay, next And we could also have incentives in the (laughs) pilot that that ensures that motivation. Right? Right, That ensures that motivation. Okay. Next short snapper. Dogs or cats? Dogs. 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 Hey, what a group! (laughs) What a group. Cats are the worst. Um, (laughs) Who is your favorite candidate for the Democratic nomination? Pete. Mayor Pete? Yes, Mayor Pete. All right. Elizabeth Warren. Mine's between Pete and Yang. I'm going with Pete. Really? Yeah. You're going with Pete? I'm going to go with Pete. I'm I'm part of the Yang gang, like Alvin, but I, I have a soft spot for for Biden. Oh, oh! And no I don't know. Bernie? It's the Obama no thing. I, I think you almost have to have a soft spot for Biden at this point. <laughs> 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 um, favorite 
Canadian musical artist. Contemporary? Alive? No, of all time. Okay. <laughs> so hard. <laughs> yeah, so many. Ask me. Of all time. I am I'm, gonna ask I'm you. at the end. <laughs> Pardon? Oh, you're She's passing? passing. No, I'm gonna I wanna think. Okay. Drake. This is a good job. Drake? Yep. This is a good so one. Cool. Oh, so cool. So cool. <laughs> That's who I was thinking too, but of all time, Drake's yeah. amazing. This is the first thing that came out of my head. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He may be the biggest Canadian star of all time. Yeah. This is really hard. It's not hard. It is hard because the weekend isn't. His mom lives in my riding. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, you can't really say all of his music. And you know, as a form of minister of education, I don't think that's a really good thing. And I love Celine Dion. I love ballads. Mm. Celine Dion's a good <laughs> so, choice. <laughs> that is not a struggle for me. Drake no. is a struggle for me. <laughs> okay. I have a lot of contemporary people, but I think. Um, you know, when it comes to music and, and change and personality and history, I, I'm going to go with Neil Young. Oh, good yeah, choice. Yeah, it's a solid choice. Yes, I'm glad you didn't go all the way back to Guy Lombardo, but uh, <laughs> Neil Young, <laughs> solid choice. Brenda. I thought mine would be a cliche, but Gore Downey. Yeah. 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 It's a bit of a cliche, a little but little bit, I, 30 shows. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a true fan. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say Gore Downey, too, yeah. but I was still thinking about Gord Downey versus Drake. I don't know. Yeah, Gord Downey. Nobody said Justin Bieber. Or no. no. That's your age group. He, he no, was born in London. that's not our age group. <laughs> yeah. Nobody said my pick either, which is the band. Mm. I had Robbie Robertson on the podcast, and uh, what a legendary person he is. But you know. Bare naked you know, ladies. You know, what, you, know, you, know what, you know what artists would say? Joni Mitchell. Yeah, yeah. Actual she musical is, artists yeah, would yeah, say yeah, the yeah, best yeah. musician Canada ever produced was Johnny Mitchell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. not in stream volume. Drake is number one in the world now, right? I'm talking about in influence, <laughs> not in that. Oh, yeah, Drake's, <laughs> Drake's enormous. Yeah. Um, where am I at in the story? Alvin, name a political hero. Barack Obama. That's okay. Michelle I met him once. Michelle Obama. <laughs> okay. Um, say Nelson Mandela. Yeah. Well, I was. <laughs> he took mine. I'm a big fan of Jean Chrétien. Okay. Yeah. Bold. <laughs> uh, Jacinda Ardern. Pardon? Oh. Jacinda Ardern. The Prime Minister of New Zealand. Oh, okay. Big fan. Yep. Excellent. Um, and age. so, this is my closing question oh. to you all. Oh. And you each take a couple minutes to answer it. Right? But I don't want you to give a list. I want you to give me one thing. Because so often I think we go through these races and we never know what the central core thing is of people. We know what their orientation is and we know what a lot of things they'd like to try to do. But, you know, a lot of this gets boiled down to your core determination to get something done, right? And I think of... I think of um, Paul Martin, who for everything else that he was known about in politics, he fundamentally was about the First Nations Indigenous relationship. And so in the dying days of his government in 2006, instead of campaigning, as I was begging him to do, he was in a meeting room giving away $5 billion to uh, uh, First Nations Indigenous education, health care, water, housing. Okay, What is your thing? Right? What do you most want to do if you get to become premier? And maybe I'll start with you, Mitzi. So my whole campaign and how I see Ontario is about the changing economy, the disruption, the automation. I grew up at a time when you know my family and I immigrated to this country, and my dad uh, was a transport truck driver. My mom worked in an auto manufacturing plant. And they would always say, you know, to my brothers and I, you know, education, that's the path. And, and I certainly saw that. Right now, I see that, you know, the change that is hitting our province is going to be rapid. And I believe that I have a, an opportunity based on the experiences that I've had in technology, in big business, in small business and entrepreneurial environments, as well as in government, to really help to shape that 
that future. It's it's going to hit us. It's going to come. And, and by that, I mean, you know, things like when a manufacturing plant or a large industry leaves, that it doesn't leave a decaying footprint, that we actually reimagine that space as live work environments. Um, we have transit and mobility access to those spaces, R&D, new economy companies. It's something that I experienced while I was at Bell Canada, and we invested in the King West Corridor in Liberty Village. And I encouraged the company to lay fiber there because I really believed in what was happening on the ground with the new media startup companies, with the fact that people needed to find ways of living in this city that was connected to transit. And, uh, and I see that working in many different size of towns and communities across the province. So my vision is about affordability, opportunity for a changing Ontario. Okay. Michael, what's the thing? Yeah. So when I, uh, if I became the leader and then the premier of this province and I, it was my last day on the job and um, I thought to myself, you know, you know, what I would be most proud of leaving that building, it would be to make sure that Ontario is the best possible place in the world to raise a child where they feel the safest, they have the best access to education, where they're the healthiest, uh, they, feel, um, they feel like they can contribute. And um, our dreams and aspirations here in Ontario are built on theirs. And to me, I would be very satisfied if I could leave politics knowing that that was an actual truth. Thanks. Brenda? The thing that drove me here was uh, in my practice, I've represented thousands of Ontarians who have disabilities or illnesses. And time and time again, I would hear the stories about how they could not access the health care that they needed. They had to wait months and months for an MRI, and then they didn't know if they needed surgery or when they were going to need surgery. And half the time, the reason they called our office was just complete frustration with their inability to get medical care. And I started thinking that if you're calling a lawyer to get a doctor, there is a problem. And so we started within our firm wor working as sort of healthcare concierges as part of our value added to try and get people to access the healthcare that they needed. That is not how this is supposed to work. We have excellent doctors, nurses, allied healthcare professionals. We do not have excellent access to them. So finding the solution, and I'm not saying that I have the solution right now, but I know that the solution is available so that we can put people together with the healthcare professionals in a way that is actually um, streamlined and sensible and economic so that we can actually be proud of our universal health care because it's not the people providing the service that are the problem. It is the delivery model. So if I can make one difference, it will be making sure that that access line is improved so that everybody, regardless of where they live in this province, has access to uh, the health care they need to live happy, healthy lives. Kate? Uh, the thing? The thing. The thing. What is your thing? The, the thing for me would be inequality in all forms because it feels wrong and unfair. And I mean it in every way. So in a place as wealthy as Ontario, having as many people as we do who are experiencing homelessness or struggling to make ends meet, it means uh, living in a society where women still earn a lot less than men. It means living in a province where parts of Ontario are doing really well and other parts are falling into decline. It means a political system where a few people have a lot of power and then a whole bunch of people have none. So I want to see a world where, you know, it doesn't matter kind of where you came from or what your starting point is. Uh, it doesn't matter what happens to you. You know, things can happen. We run into bad luck. You face some kind of loss where people aren't stuck, where we live in a province where there is always options. There's always choice. You are supported to be able to pursue whatever a happy, healthy life looks for you. Right now, I don't think we live in a world like that, and that's the reason I'm running. Thank you. Alvin? I think society is always judged by the opportunities that they leave for their kids behind. And uh, I like to talk to my, my kids a lot, but it's the whole reason I got into politics. And it's not just about my kids. It's about all the kids that we have here and the opportunities that we are or aren't providing them. And the first thing I became an advocate for um, was on child care because so many people don't have access to quality um, licensed child care in this province. And when I had 
two kids under four years old, uh, for four years, we were spending $35,000 a year. Parents can't afford that. And I worked for the Ontario government. My wife is a nurse. And without that kind of access, you're not creating the best opportunities to give them a head start. And throughout this process, I've been lucky enough to, to, to meet a lot of people. And I met this mother who um, was at this, uh, this, this, this Christmas dinner uh, in Hamilton uh, at a church where um, they were being provided food um, because they couldn't have any. They didn't have any. They didn't have the money for it. And almost everybody there, um, I realized, was part of the basic income pilot. And when you make a promise as a society to say that we're not going to let these people slip through the cracks, and then you see the faces of, of that betrayal when, when this government took that away from them, and to realize so many of these people were people who had children, who had dependents, and it's just, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to realize that we have hundreds of thousands of, of children living in poverty in this province and that we have 2 million Ontarians living under the poverty line, including nearly four or 500,000 children, and that we haven't done everything we can to prevent this from happening and to prevent this from continuing to happen when we know what the solutions are. That's just that type of ignorance, that type of inability for us to, to connect with those people because they're those people is just infuriating. And it, it, it makes me angry, but it also motivates me um, to get up and say that these are the things that we need to do and we need to be those champions. We need to be the people and the party that embodies all that spirit that says this will not happen under our watch. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for this. Um, I want to thank you for coming to my little podcast. Uh, it's a real <laughs> it's favor great. that you all did to me, and I really, I really appreciate it. And it's such a busy time for you. Um, this was a really impressive outing, as far as I'm concerned. Um, you're all um, adornments to the Liberal Party, um, and uh, we're very lucky as Liberals that you're all running for this job and seeking this job and I, I wish you a competitive convention yes. um, thank you uh, thank I you. wish you a competitive convention coming up I want to thank all of our listeners I want to thank the Orange Lounge for hosting this event our presenting sponsor TELUS and our original sponsor the Ontario Real Estate Association anybody out there listening if you liked or didn't like or whatever your opinion was say it on social media or go to iTunes and give us a rating it always helps Thank you very much for this week. Next week, we'll be back with Scott Reed and Jenny Byrne. Oh, wow.